Hello again, everybody. This is Gary Mrozinski, and I'm going to be taking you through Chapter 3 of Schiller and Gebhardt's The Macroeconomy Today. This is the most important chapter in the macroeconomics course. And in fact, it applies to both macroeconomics and microeconomics. In fact, I would say it's even more important, probably, in the microeconomics course, which you may be taking next semester. So let's get right to it. This is the chapter on supply and demand. Have you ever wondered, when you go to fill up your car with gas, maybe you do it once a week, you're filling up your car and you can see what the gas price is, you fill it up next week and it has changed. Maybe it has gone up, maybe it has gone down. You probably are wondering what makes the price of gasoline per gallon go up or go down? The answer is supply and demand. If the price has changed, something has happened to either supply or demand. And that made the market price change. That's what we're going to study in this chapter, exactly how that works, the mechanics of how changes in overall supply or overall demand will make the market price change. Here are these three questions which keep resurfacing every chapter. Well, we're really going to delve into this in this chapter. What determines the price of a good or service? Well, we're going to be learning in this chapter that the market will determine the price of a good or service. The market is where supply and demand interact to determine the price. How will the price affect its production and consumption? I'm just going to save that one and answer that as we go through the chapter. And why do prices and production levels often change? Again, we're going to learn that it happens because either overall supply increases or decreases, or overall demand increases or decreases, and that makes the market price change. We'll learn about why that happens and how it happens in this chapter. If you recall in Chapter 2, we talked a bit about how the U.S. specializes in producing goods and services for which it has a competitive advantage and imports, then, goods and services from other economies when those goods and services, uh, those other economies have a competitive advantage in producing those compared to us. Well, that's on a macro level. Let's think on a micro level. We don't produce, we individuals don't produce all the goods and services we need for our families, do we? Maybe at one time that happened, but not in the modern economy. I mean, there was once a time where people would maybe live off the land and try to grow all the food that your family needs and maybe even make the products, the other products that you need. You wouldn't have many products, but you could probably do that. Well, in the modern economy, we don't try to produce everything we need and our families need. We choose one thing and we produce that. We produce whatever our family needs maybe, and then we sell the excess for income use that income to buy all the other goods and services. This is basically what we do. This is such common sense, it's not even uh, worth mentioning, maybe. But uh, that's really what happens, isn't it? Maybe you produce accounting services. Maybe you have an accounting business. Maybe you're a sole proprietorship and you produce accounting services. Well, you produce more accounting services than you and your family need, right? You have a business, you sell them to others. That gives you income. You use that income then to purchase all the goods and services produced by others that your family needs. So you are specializing and trading. So it's really the same thing. And again, we're returning to this discussion we had in Chapter 2. On a macro level, the same thing happens. We, in the U.S., specialize domestically in producing that which we have a lower opportunity cost to produce that which we have a competitive advantage in producing. And other countries do the same thing. So again, the kinds of work that has gone to other economies has tended to be more labor intensive and less capital intensive. We have very high value capital and very high quality labor resources compared to other economies which have lower value capital and lower skilled workers, which gives them a lower labor rate, and so for more labor-intensive work, 
lower productivity work, they have a competitive advantage over us. And those are the kinds of things we import. Now we're going to start talking about what's called the circular flow diagram. The circular flow diagram, or the circular flow model, is a model of the whole economy. And there are three types of market participants in this model, in an economy. So again, this is like a national economy you're thinking of. There are consumers. Consumers are interested in maximizing the utility they get from the goods and services they purchase with their resources. Their resources is the income they have to spend. Businesses, their objective is always to maximize profits by selling the goods and services they produce. While keeping their costs low, that's what helps you maximize profits. And then the government plays a role too. So all three of these participants are in this model. So again, consumers purchase goods and services in product markets. There's another kind of market though. There's a factor market, factors of production, resource markets. So there are product markets and there are resource markets or factor markets. In product markets, consumers are the buyers. In factor markets, consumers are the sellers, and I'll explain that when we get to the model. Businesses play a role in each one of these two types of markets, too. In product markets, businesses produce the goods, sell the goods. They are the sellers, but they are the buyers in resource markets because businesses need to purchase resources or pay for the use of resources in order to produce the goods that they produce. And again, the government plays a role, too. The government produces goods and services, too, don't they? We're going to learn in Chapter 5 that the government in the U.S., even though we are, we think, the preeminent market system economy, where based on the, the, you know, the concept of capitalism, where you believe that goods and services should be primarily produced by private companies, even in our economy, the government is producing uh, a fairly substantial portion of GDP. Plus, they have a role in regulating markets and some other roles that we'll talk about uh, later in the course. So they need to be included too. And then there's also international participants because it's not really a closed system. So I'm going to show you two diagrams. The first one is my diagram, not from the textbook. And then we're going to add a couple pieces to show you then the diagram that's in your text. So I like to start with this one. So again, you can see there are two markets. This is a model of the economy, the US economy, let's say. So product markets on the top. Well, you can see product markets. Uh, and first, let me explain the arrows. The green arrows are money, money flowing circularly. All right, so that's going in this model, looks like it's going uh, clockwise. And then the red arrows represent goods and services and resources flowing in the opposite direction. All right, so product markets, businesses are the sellers, consumers, individuals, households are the buyers. So the red arrows first, you can see businesses uh, supply the goods and services to the product markets. They get purchased by consumers who in return spend their incomes, that becomes revenue for the businesses, right? That's pretty simple. We think about that all the time. What you don't think about maybe as much is that for every dollar spent in a product market, there's a dollar spent in a resource market, several of them, different types of resource markets. And the same thing is true for a whole economy. For every dollar spent in all of our product markets, there are dollars spent in resource markets because businesses have to purchase or pay for the use of resources in order to produce their products. All right, so we're looking now at the bottom half of this diagram. Consumers, individuals, households own the resources. Now this is probably the trickiest part of this. You know businesses need to purchase the factors of production. Do you remember what they are? They are labor, land, capital, and then entrepreneurship, which is really a kind of labor resource. 
businesses have to purchase or pay for the use of those resources in order to produce their products. Each of those factors of production are owned by individuals. So let's think about how that works. Well, the biggest of them is labor. You own your labor services. You probably don't think of it that way, but you own your labor services and you are selling your labor services in a resource market, in a labor market. Now you may work for an employer. Well, again, you don't think of it this way, but you are selling your labor services to your employer who is then purchasing your labor services and paying for them in the form of some form of income, wages or salaries, right? That is the biggest portion of the factors of production in our, in our economy, given that we are primarily a services economy. So that's the biggest category uh, as a percentage of overall uh, income, its wages and salaries. So individuals certainly own those, right? Because if you don't feel you're getting a fair shake with your current employer, you can leave. You'd be back in a resource market, a labor market, looking to sell your labor services to another employer that's going to pay you more money, right? So it's competitive. Resource markets are competitive just like product markets are competitive with a market system economy. All right, how about land and capital? So remember what these are. Capital is, for a business, the facility you produce in, your factory, an office building, whatever it is, and the equipment, the major equipment especially, uh, and including computer systems and networks and all of that, right? That is your capital. Your capital is standing on land. The business has to pay for the capital and the land or pay for the use of the capital and the land. It may be that they're leasing the facilities or they're leasing the land. Well, someone owns that those facilities and, and that land in that case. That person is receiving then a form of income, rent, or lease income. And then you might say, well, sometimes the business owns the, usually the business owns the facility, owns the capital, owns the land that they're producing on. That is true, but someone owns the business. And the business owners then are compensated by the business for their having provided the capital and the land to produce on. So in other words, someone owns the business, those owners are paid profits. Why are they paid profits? Because they own the capital and they own the land and they need to be compensated for that fact. Even large publicly traded companies who sell shares of stock, and there may be thousands or tens of thousands of investors that own shares of stock in a very large company, they are compensated because they own a fractional share of the capital and the land that the business owns. It's really owned by the owners of the business. The owners of the business then, there are profit distributions in the form of dividend distributions or interest income, either way. But why do they get those distributions? Because the shareholders own the capital and own the land and they get compensated for it. This is the trickiest part of this model, understanding that part of it, that there's actually a resource market for capital and land. The buyers are whoever owns the business and has purchased equity in that business or shares of stock, same thing. You own equity in a business. And businesses do pay their owners for the use of the capital and the use of the land because these are important factors of production. That's the trickiest part of this model, getting, getting to understand that. So again, businesses are paying for the resources they're using to produce their products in the form of wages to employees and salaries, rent to anything that they're renting or leasing, and then profit for the capital that they need and are using to produce their products. These are all different forms of income that go to individuals, consumers households. So this is a simpler version of this model. There's only two things that are missing. And so now I'm going to introduce the model that is in the textbook in chapter three. There it is. This says introduce the government. The government does play a role. The government actually does produce some goods and services and it does actually purchase resources, factors of production. Uh, but then they also regulate in the economy. And they provide other types of uh, support to markets, which, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, what the government's role is. They also provide uh, 
a system of laws, a system of courts, law enforcement, that kind of thing. Now, what about in international participants? Let's look at product markets. This is not really a closed system because some goods and services that are sold in product markets in the United States are imported. They come from outside the system. And some goods and services that are produced in our economy are not sold in our product markets. They're exported and sold in product markets overseas. So that's where you see international participants, that little loop up above that interacts with product markets. The same is true in factor markets. There are international participants. Sometimes the factors are provided from outside the system. This might be Toyota who opens a uh, manufacturing plant in Kentucky or something like that. Those factors of production were provided by Toyota, which is a Japanese company, but they were brought into our economy and now they're part of resource markets within our economy. And then the same is true if a U.S. company were to provide resources to operate outside the economy in another country. And even labor resources. We often have people who come from Europe to work here for a while. Or maybe a U.S. worker who maybe even every day is driving across the border into Canada to work. So that is them selling their labor resources in a resource market in Canada. So that's international participants, that little loop on the bottom of the diagram. So really it's the same diagram, it's just introduced two other factors. So this becomes important. We're going to talk about this again when we get to uh, chapter 5 because GDP, remember, is a measure of everything that's produced in our national economy, in our macroeconomy. It's a measure of all the goods and services that are produced in a year. And one way to think of it is it's like if you were to total up all the dollars that were spent to purchase all the goods and services produced in our economy in a year. If you do that, you're measuring all the dollars that are spent in product markets. There's another way that we measure it. If you're to total up all the income that was paid to everyone that played a part in producing all the goods and services, either as employees or owners of the business, then you're measuring all the dollars spent in factor markets. So again, that's why I say, for every dollar that's spent in a product market, in, our, in an economy, there's a dollar spent in fact some factor market. And again, we're going to return to this uh, when we get to chapter 5, and that whole chapter is on gross domestic product, how it gets measured. There's, these are the two ways that it does get measured. It's called the expenditures approach, that measures all the dollars spent in product markets, and the income approach that measures all the dollars spent in factor markets. So here's an exercise. Write down a product market in which you participated recently. So you really just have to think about even today, did you purchase anything? Did you buy a coffee on your way to school today or on your way to work? If you did, you participated in a product market. You were a buyer, you purchased that coffee, there was a seller, there was a business that sold it to you, and uh, there's lots of examples of that you could think of, right? You might have gotten gas, too. Now, write down a factor market in which you participated recently. Well, do you work anywhere right now? If you do, you are producing GDP. You're producing goods and services. You, you work for an employer, maybe. If you do, you sold your labor services today to your employer for eight hours of work, or however many hours you worked, right? and you help to produce some good or service that your business then sold. So you participated in a factor market too, a resource market, 